it was R-E-F-U-S-E, -E, yes. which can either be the verb refuse mm -hmm. or the noun refuse. And people most commonly think of, of pieces having a noun for a title as opposed to a verb. Yeah. So they might have thought it as, as a garbage piece. And I was willing to accept that. Okay. But I liked the fact that there was that, that ambiguity. Now for this making this video, and in fact, really remaking the piece for the video, mm -hmm. it's small r, small e, capital F-U-S-E, so it's right. refuse. So it's like redoing a refuse. It's, yeah, right? it's, it's, it's redoing the fuse. Yes, it's it's it a is. new fuse, and it's um, hopefully, uh, uh, there'll be some kind of fusion. Oh yeah, okay. Well, we're going to look forward to that. Uh, uh, this, uh, the original piece though was commissioned in 2017 by Turning Point and Sabah in Vancouver. As I understand it. It was a number of years ago, and my great age, I can't remember which year is, is which, but it was the 50th, 50th anniversary, really, of something. Oh, uh, the years that I'm focused on for the piece, which are the, between the summer of 1965 mm -hmm. and the summer of 1966, and a lot of things that happened in that year. We have to go back a little bit further than that to start where this piece started, yep. which was back in 1953. Uh, in 1953, I was born. In 1953, a 13-year-old uh, young lad in the United States named Frank Zappa discovered in a magazine a picture of Edgar Varese. And he looked at it and he said, whoa, that guy looks like a mad scientist and it says he's a composer. I think I want to be a composer too because I'd like to be a mad scientist. <laughs> and he also read in the, the piece in Look magazine that Perez had composed a piece exclusively for percussion, mm -hmm. ionization, of course. Yes, ionization. And he thought, I got to hear that piece. It, it took him another two years to find the record, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 13 years, and he also managed, when he got a birthday present of some money, he phoned up uh, Perez in New York and asked if he could come and visit sometime, but they never met. Oh, okay. 13 years later, in 1965, I was 13, and I also discovered Varese. Unfortunately, he died in November of 1965. Okay. Uh, in the summer of 1966, uh, Frank Zappa released his first record, with his band, it was called Freak Out. Freak Out, yes. And I bought it when it came out. Oh. Uh, and I think I didn't know about Frank Zappa before that. I think I knew a little bit about Varese because in my hometown, I had a very good public library. It's probably still okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could find things like Harry Parch's book on tuning in there. Oh, okay. And, oh, it's, uh, a, it's that kind of library. <laughs> and I think I'd, I'd already, I thought I, uh, when I was thinking about this, I thought I'd already read uh, Louise Varese's uh, uh, biography of her husband, right. Richard. But in fact, that wasn't published until about 1970, so I hadn't read it then. But anyway, either through Zappa or something, in that year, I discovered Frank Zappa, I discovered Edgar Varese, and uh, right. I was 13, just like Zappa was when he was 13 years old. Okay. So when I got around to making this piece for this program a few years ago, it was on the 50th anniversary of those years, and it was a program of chamber works by Edgar Varese, and uh, uh, symphonietta pieces, or extended symphonietta pieces, about 32 instruments of uh, Frank Zappa. And they wanted a piece from me to go with that. Okay. And quite nicely, they wanted to fit about a 15 minute piece, which I thought, oh yeah, that's like an album side. Mm -hmm. So maybe what I can do is just think about what it was like discovering and listening to music back when I was 13 years old, and what it seemed like. Because I hadn't experienced any live music, it was all from recordings and the radio, et cetera, et cetera, okay. to make this piece. And I think that's the main thing that makes this piece the oddity that it is. Okay. Yeah, because like if we, uh, I've listened to it uh, in its uh, state right now, and it was kind of, uh, I'm hearing a lot of themes going on there. Like, uh, we won't probably spoil it here in this talk, but, but it's just like, a, there, this is huge, vast world of uh, themes. Like, can you like elucidate a little more on like, what, where are where is John Oswald in all of these uh, quotations and all that as well? Well, uh, perhaps those are my roots. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I was really l listening, started listening to music on a large scale, mm -hmm. and taking in a lot of things and looking for things that are unusual for some reason. I know uh, my parents reminded me later that when I was eight years old, I said, "When I grow up, I want to be uh, an." Uh, 
Oh, what did I say I wanted to be? Now I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, uh, I said I wanted to be a nonconformist. I oh, said, oh, okay. okay. Uh, a little later, I said I wanted to be an architect, and then everybody said, wasn't that nice? The other guy wants to be an architect, and I didn't like that. So then I said, <laughs> uh, I started going around saying I want to be a fireman, and they didn't think that was as impressive. Oh, okay. uh, so I wanted to be a lot of things. But uh, one of the earliest things I said I wanted to be was a nonconformist. And I just I turned out to be irascibly that. So I was looking for weird music. I was looking for Edgar Varez. I was looking for Frank Zappa. I was looking uh, for, well, a big influence, I think, on the making of this piece would be Wendy Carlos, who oh. when I first discovered was Walter Carlos, okay. one of the early uh, uh, gender change surgery people. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, a big influence on the remaking of this piece is the idea of having live musicians right. playing the parts. There's lots of parts, big score. Yes. Yes. Uh, and having uh, accompaniment of things that place it in the way that I'd like to hear it. This happened to Wendy Carlos with the making of the music for a movie in the 80s called Tron, where the original concept was that half of the movie Tron, which is about video games, mm -hmm. about adventures in video games, uh, took place in this world, okay. uh, and the other half took place inside the video game, right, right. Uh, where there was life and death things happening. Mm -hmm. And she conceived, having been someone who was a very uh, early user of synthesizers, Moog synthesizer, switched on Bach, uh, she conceived of there being electronic music in the video world and orchestral music uh, in the live world. So she did a session with the London Symphony, a couple of sessions for the, the thing, and she was very dissatisfied with how the orchestra part came out. So uh, she started working the electronics in, in, in synchronicity, uh, which was difficult back then, uh, with... Uh, the uh, record parts, and it's a very interesting soundtrack for that reason. And it's a very interesting follow-up to a previous soundtrack she made, which was the one for uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, Clockwork Orange, I see. I see. based on a book by Anthony Burgess, right. A Clockwork Orange, uh, in which uh, uh, Wendy Carlos made uh, synthesized versions of Beethoven and Handel, mm -hmm. and really interesting and excellently done things like that. So those were things that were uh, that came to the surface when putting together this piece. The other thing that came to the surface was what happened at the beginning of is it 20, yeah, 2020 now? Yeah. Uh, so in March 2020, uh, a couple of orchestras, right when things started locking down for what looked like might be a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. An orchestra in Europe put together something that looked like a early Zoom version right. of the orchestra playing in their isolations. Mm -hmm. uh, within a couple of days, and I don't know if he was aware of this or not, oh, where did I put my notebook because I can't remember his name, but one of the uh, musicians with the uh, uh, Toronto Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. Stephen Beecher, no, uh, Jeffrey Beecher, Okay. In, a, in a few days, put together a, a version of a bit of uh, Appalachian Spring by Copeland with musicians in isolation. And it's the best done one of those things of mm. people popping up in isolation in squares on the screen. And, yes. and I, what I discovered that was most intriguing about was the sound of everybody playing in their rooms, nobody in a large room, right. not much reverberation, very definitely not the kind of perspective you have when you're recording an orchestra in a big hall, even if you use close-up microphones. Mm -hmm. And the sound was had an intimacy that was fantastic. It, um, it brought me into the music and the performance. Mm -hmm. I knew the challenges of putting the whole thing together were very uh, uh, daunting and interesting. Right. But I really wanted to do it with this piece. And then the New Music uh, Concerts Commission came along and it looked like this was a way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know how uh, Jeffrey Beecher did that in a few days because as New Music Concerts knows, I'm still working on the piece now and we're going to have uh, a, our broadcast in a week's time. Mm -hmm. And 
it's crunch time. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got all these things. Like I have hundreds of files from musicians. Mm -hmm. Some are I've got audio files that need to be synchronized with video files. I have different cases of things that uh, where, for instance, in some cases the musicians recorded the entire audio and, and may have edited it together, and then did a video performance where they finger sync or yes. okay. play sync along with their recording. Mm -hmm. And the first one to do that, uh, John Zofsky and guitar, uh, he fooled me for oh, a good 10 minutes before I said, well, wait a minute, about that one little really tricky part. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of that going on in uh, this piece. Uh, and there's a lot of illusions of are these people playing or not. Uh, it is currently such a mess that I don't know exactly how prominent that's going to be in what the, the video piece is. Mm -hmm. But I, I've discovered that we're really in stage one of three stages. Uh, I'm making this piece that really works as a video with a soundtrack mm -hmm. uh, that's featuring the musicians who are uh, talented enough and kind enough to play these parts for me. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, given a little bit of leeway as to, uh, uh, let's say, as Frank Zappa would say, put eyebrows on it, <laughs> which is like, ah. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Anytime you really get into something, your eyebrows go up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, there's also a lot of other elements. A lot of them are quotational elements, as you've seen, mm -hmm. and electro-quotational elements, which means actual the actual uh, recorded documentation of various things. Yes, yes. Uh, very little in the way of sound. There's one little bit, uh, which I won't say what it is, where uh, a recorded example from back in 1965 mm -hmm. is the predominant thing in the mix currently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, all those things are coming together into this piece. So that's stage one. Stage two is doing a proper mix of the piece uh, for audio listening only, okay. and there's an awful lot of still working on, sometimes even the individual lines of the musicians, and sometimes there are parts that are being driven by MIDI, which is the computer, yes, kind yes. of conducting uh, what sounds happen when, mm -hmm. uh, to be in parallel lines with uh, the musicians. In some cases, I'm painting one part or the other you know, um, various sound programs that I use okay. to make them fit together. That's stage two. That's that's coming then soon. We see we see uh, we see Edgar Briss and there's Frank Zappa and uh, John Oswald, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. That was for the, uh, the the concert that we did back in 2017. Mm. 2015, of course. And I'm surprised you have an LP for this. <laughs> Uh, there's not going to be an LP. In fact, uh, oh, okay. I, uh, my record company, Phony, has uh, moved over to entirely uh, online uh, releases, which are fan it's fantastic because I can right. make revisions. Okay. It takes me back to the 80s when uh, uh, I switched from making records, which I did in the 70s, mm -hmm. to making cassettes exclusively uh, where I could do revisions on things that were in the series, and it's just my tendency. Okay. And to have a direct contact with uh, listeners who would mail order for me directly, okay. is in very small quantities. Okay. And that is happening again uh, with these kind of uh, in internet distributors, mm -hmm. where I know who's, who's buying things, I know who's accessing things. Mm -hmm. They can access for free, or they can download, purchase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's great. Okay. So Refuse is in the rascally clepitoire. Do you, do you recognize this place? I know that you moved to town a few years to, ago. I moved to town like uh, five years ago, but I've been visiting since eight years ago, and so I know this. Honest Ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the building's no longer there. It's no longer there. Well, check out the sign. Yeah, classics from the Rascali Clepitoire. Clepitoire. Yeah. Uh, where, where did that term come from, Jerome? Yeah, I wonder. Uh, it seems like uh, this is pretty much like a spin-off from, from the Plunder Phonics thing you were doing back in the 80s. In a sense, yes. Uh, in that quotation is a really big part of it, or transforming quotations into something new. But the, um, the difference is that Plunder Phonics, uh, that's a term that I made up uh, in the mid-80s to do things that I've been doing since the late 60s, uh, 
are, which are electrical quotations. They're taking a recording and changing it into something else. People are familiar with things called mashups, where you might take yeah. one uh, pop song and another pop song and stick them together and see right. how it works. Right. Uh, that's one sub uh, set of the genre of plungophonics. There's also a lot of people who use the term plungophonics for things that I don't think fit that definition at all. Okay. But the word gets around a lot. Okay. Rascally Clepitoire uh, started uh, several years later in 1991 when I got uh, my first serious commission from a performing ensemble. It was from the Colonist Quartet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the second one I did, the first one I did for them, Spectre, they played hundreds of times around the world mm -hmm. yes. since then, and they still play it. The second one uh, was the first Rascally Clepitoire piece, and it was uh, five movements all based on uh, Ludwig van Beethoven's music. Mm -hmm. uh, one movement prelude is something that has had a life of its own. In fact, it's on, uh, where are we? It's on this release here. Oh, oh, there you go. Classics from the Rascally Clepitoire EP. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's not. I lied. This is uh... I'm sorry, I get mixed up on what's on my thing. It's on this one. Okay, 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 okay. Let's B9. Switch it up. Let's switch it up. Along with the oh, yes, all, yes, yes. all nine symphonies of Beethoven abridged into 30 minutes. Oh, right. By me. And performed by Ensemble Modern in Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what else do we have? Two, yeah. ver two different versions of uh, Beethoven's uh, first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Mm -hmm. As performed by me in one case, and as transformed by me in another case. I also made a, a mock-up cover that I, I don't know where it's going to go. Hmm. This is of the Distance Ensemble, the New Music Concerts Distance Ensemble. It has its own cover, I think. Yeah. There for Refuse. For, for, this, refuse. Uh, for this particular performance or something. I think if they all got together, it might look like that in ceramic. Oh. If Jeff Koons did his version of it, I would say. <laughs> I see, I see. Well, one thing actually caught my attention when you were like talking about uh, Refuse and this, this idea of the recording distance ensembles. It's like, like you're, you're capturing the intimacy of it all. You're not emulating a concert hall when you like put them all together. Is that, am I correct in that assumption? Yes, and what's, I didn't assume. I, I thought I would at least go to, I thought first base was to make a very literal uh, video recording of the parts that, of the piece that's designed as a concert piece for them to record. Mm -hmm. uh, then I discovered that what really seems to be working is to give some sense of the making of the thing. So, and one of the instructions I gave to the musicians was I wanted them to uh, shoot their uh, playing of the instrument it didn't seem like the sort of piece that uh, should be a focus on their personalities oh, yes. as, as displayed in their faces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's something that I take up from uh, watching some videos of like symphonic performances where you have a lot of people you have to focus right. on with the camera right, right, and, right. The, and the conductor, etc. Yes. In fact, I've just been working on a new version of a piece called Lontonophon that is... Uh, repurposing all those kind of, uh, well, many dozen uh, mm -hmm. orchestral videos that I've, I've found. Yeah, actually, well, what about what struck, uh, struck, uh, struck me about that is like you're actually mashing all these images together. Like you can't even like decipher much of like uh, the individual personalities and in all these orchestra performances and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so um, let's end our chat here in this end. Uh, so yes, it's sir. like, uh, thank you for actually. Uh, gracing us with your presence, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Like, Thank in you. A few minutes. Yeah, yeah, stay yeah. tuned for the performance. Yes, yeah, like that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, stay tuned for the upcoming performance at eight o'clock p.m. EST. Stay sure. on your seats. Yeah, just be there. See ya.
Recording in progress. Beginning to hit one, one, two, three, four. So, John. Oops. Eleven. So, is this the kind of thing you're looking for? Right? G tall. Thirteen. Fourteen. And, uh, you know, when I play the vibes. Fifteen. Sixteen. Into measure of six. This is the kind of thing you're looking for. Okay. You know, I mean, I would refocus. One, two, uh, three, four. One. Right? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that might have been weird. One more time. Same thing. One, two, three, four. It's as high as I can get it unless I, I get up into the ceiling. The beginning of pay of percussion four, bass drum. It's recorded 227 alone. One. Lion's roar, measure two, four count into two. One, One two, two, three. three. Measures eight to 43 with a two bar pickup. Thank you. 